climate models used by the IPCC for their fifth assessment report are, hmm, how can I put this nicely? I'll let you fill in the blank after this video. You won't be wanting to fill it in with anything like fantastic or great or excellent. The only value they have is to perpetuate the mythical relationship between carbon dioxide emissions and global warming. The climate models used by the IPCC can't simulate surface temperatures, precipitation, or sea ice area. Now that's to name just a few climate-related metrics and processes that climate models can't simulate. Climate models can't explain the recent plateau in global surface temperatures. There are peer-reviewed papers that confirm that fact. And that means climate models can't be used by scientists or politicians to claim that human factors, like man-made greenhouse gases, were the cause of the warming from the mid-1970s to the turn of the century. Since the models can't explain the plateau, they can't explain the warming. This seems to have eluded the politicians who negotiated the language of the IPCC's Summary for Policymakers. Here are a few more examples of just how poorly climate models simulate metrics that are important to our understanding of global climate. Precipitation. There are some disagreements between the three satellite and rain gauge based global precipitation data sets. So there are still a few questions as to whether global precipitation has decreased since 1979 or whether or not the amount of precipitation has remained relatively constant in that time. On the other hand, the climate models used by the IPCC for their fifth assessment report indicate that if precipitation depended on man-made greenhouse gases, there would be much more precipitation annually than actually exists, and it would have increased slightly since 1979. Because climate models are so useless at simulating precipitation over the past 33 years, they're useless for telling us how precipitation will change in the future. Let's move to sea ice area. It's well known that Arctic sea ice area has declined in recent years. It's also well known that at the other end of the world, the sea ice area in the southern ocean surrounding Antarctica is increasing. The climate models being used by the IPCC have guesstimated incorrectly again. They guessed that sea ice area in both polar oceans should be decreasing if man-made greenhouse gases were responsible for the variations in sea ice area. Let's look again at surface temperatures. Climate models look even worse when we examine global sea surface temperatures during the satellite era. Remember, the oceans cover 70% of the planet. During the satellite era, global sea surface temperatures warmed at a rate that was about half as fast as the rate estimated by the climate models used by the IPCC. Or phrased the other way, the models doubled the actual rate of warming. That's a horrendous failure. It's mind-boggling and there appears to be a very simple explanation for it. In the real world, the North Atlantic has an additional mode of natural variability that caused its sea surface temperatures to warm almost three times faster than those of the global oceans over the past 31 years. That additional mode of natural variability is very well known, and it's called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. In a 2006 paper, Trenberth and Shea recommended the best way to portray the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation is to subtract global sea surface temperatures from the sea surface temperatures of the North Atlantic. If we follow the same procedure with the model outputs, we can see that the climate models can't simulate 
that additional mode of multi-decadal natural variability in the sea surface temperatures of the North Atlantic. Now keep in mind that the additional warming of the North Atlantic is temporary. It will eventually slow down and then cool for a number of decades. Back to the disparity between the models and the data for the surface temperatures of the global oceans during the satellite era. So, how did the climate modelers compensate for their failure to model the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation? The modelers appear to have tuned their models so that they force the sea surface temperatures of all of the global oceans to warm at the higher rate of the North Atlantic. That's astounding. They did that because they needed the surface of the oceans to warm at a higher rate in order to make land surface temperatures warm at a higher rate and to make Arctic sea ice melt. But that's caused big problems with their projections. For projections of future climate, the temporary higher warming rate of the North Atlantic was simply extended into the future. And the global oceans were set to match that higher North Atlantic rate, compounding the error. Now think about it. The, mar the models are going to go marching upward into absurd levels. However, the surface temperatures of the Pacific Ocean haven't warmed in 20 years. And the surface of the Southern Ocean surrounding Antarctica has cooled over the past 31 years. And to add the icing to the cake, the additional warming of the North Atlantic stopped 10 years ago. Kind of remarkable, isn't it? when you think about the billions and billions of dollars spent on climate models every year, they still have no skill at simulating basic climate metrics and processes. And worse, after a couple of decades of modeling efforts, their projections of future climate are worthless. These have been just a few examples of how horribly climate models perform. If you'd like further information and a much more detailed discussion about how bad the IPCC's climate models are at simulating the real world, then you need to read my latest book, Climate Models Fail. It's available in PDF and Kindle editions. See my website, Climate Observations, for more information and a free preview. Y'all have a nice day.